Hi, I'm Jasmine Robertson, Assistant Curator for the Colorado Railroad Museum. It is my privilege to host this episode of Small Wonders as we launch a two-part series on Lucius Beebe and Charles Clegg, iconic railroad photographers, pioneering book authors, and well-known and openly gay couple during the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. In May of 2023, the Colorado Railroad Museum debuted a joint exhibit with the Center for Railroad Photography and Art entitled The Lens of Extravagance. The Center's traveling exhibit, B.B. and Clegg, Their Enduring Photographic Legacy, is on display, featuring 20 photos by the pair. Romance Along the Rails, The Phenomenon of B.B. and Clegg, is the museum's companion exhibit, highlighting B.B. and Clegg's Colorado connections, correspondence, and publications. Together, these two exhibits paint a colorful picture of the extraordinary life and love that B.B. and Clegg shared together. For the first part of this series, we are pleased to introduce to you a video created by the Center for Railroad Photography and Art for the dual exhibits displayed at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This video features not only the many railroad photography and writing accomplishments of Lucius B.B. and Charles Clegg, but also highlights of their touching romance. They lived in a time when gay relationships were not deemed socially acceptable. However, they enjoyed the privileges their social standings brought them. They lived their lives lavishly and extravagantly, attending and hosting parties, owning and living in private rail cars, and going on luxurious narrow gauge tours. They used their influence to bring railroad photography into the popular realm, and in the process brought important attention to Colorado's vanishing narrow gauge lines. If you're a fan of railroading and photography, we think you'll find this documentary very engaging. For over three decades, the literary works of Lucius Beebe and Charles Clegg set the gold standard for publications on railroad photography. These two individuals were not only authors and photographers, but also historians who specialized in documenting the American West. Their books, along with Beebe's newspaper columns in New York City and San Francisco, and their ownership of the Territorial Enterprise newspaper, played a significant role in chronicling popular history. However, their most remarkable contribution was bringing railroad history and rail fanning into the mainstream consciousness, effectively establishing it as a legitimate hobby and a valuable heritage worth preserving. As a duo, Beebe and Clegg embodied larger-than-life personalities. Contrary to Beebe's carefully crafted public image as sophisticated New Yorkers, those who knew them personally described them as approachable, amicable, and dedicated individuals. These qualities contrasted with their glamorous reputations. There is no denying Beebe's status as a celebrity. He had already achieved fame before Clegg entered the scene, and it played a pivotal role in his early success in the publishing industry. Beebe saw himself as a Renaissance man, a person well-versed in various fields and committed to achieving excellence. In his self-penned obituary, which was published in the San Francisco Chronicle, B.B. describes how he viewed himself and how he hoped others would view his legacy. He stated, I admire most of all the Renaissance man, and if it can be said without pretentiousness, I like to think of myself as one, at least in small measure. Not a Michelangelo, mark you, but perhaps a poor man's Cellini or a road company Cosmo di Medici. The medieval man and the Renaissance man did a number of things, many of them well, a few beautifully. He was no damn specialist. I like to think that Chuck and I do a number of things that have no special relationship to one another. In the territorial enterprise, we ran a paper of outrage that only incidentally is the largest weekly west of the Missouri. Anyway, it's the best of its kind. Our books on the west and railroading are the best we can devise, always beautifully produced and sometimes intelligent. That they appear from time to time as bestsellers isn't particularly pertinent. It may even be a liability to the perfectionism we aim at. 
We admire to give good parties, and the measure of their success is the number of empties, the size of the restaurant bill, and the number of screams for bail during the night. If anything is worth doing, it's worth doing in style, and on your own terms, and nobody goddamned else's. I like nice clothes because they are an item in an overall facade. In themselves, they are something silly and floppish. I like big houses and hotel suites and a big dog because they become me. Not for ostentation, but because they give me personal pleasure and satisfaction. I prefer Rolls Royces and Bentleys, simply and without equivocation, because they are the best. Not just runners-ups or compromises, but the best. Like Bollinger's, Colt Firearms, Suits by Henry Pohl, and Traveling Canard. Chuck and I keep a private railroad car because it has style and comfort, and maybe we are railroad touched in the head, and anyways, the dog likes it. Also, there is no bartenders to say, that will be all for you, sir. We like people who never give a passing thought to public opinion or the suffrage of society. Not who desperately antagonize it, but simply are unaware that it exists. We like the Gene Fuller's aporphism. Money is something to be thrown off the back of trains. If we cease to have the money, or the trains either, we've got the memories, and may get good old bits if the competition isn't too keen that day. I like the old bits to say, everything he did was made to measure. He never got an idea off the rack. Lucius Morris Beebe, born in Wakefield, Massachusetts, on December 9, 1902, hailed from a prestigious and esteemed Boston family. As a mischievous youngster, Lucius often found himself in trouble with school authorities, and he faced expulsion from Yale University after publicly taunting a staff member during a school play. However, his fortunes improved at Harvard, where he graduated with honors. After completing his studies, Beebe ventured from New England to New York City having spent some time as a contributor to the literary section of the Boston Transcript. In 1929, at the age of 27, he joined the Herald Tribune staff and remained with the publication for 21 years. Beebe swiftly gained a reputation for his flamboyance, earning the moniker Mr. New York, a title he embraced and loved. Beebe's fascination with railroads began to blossom when he penned the 1935 book Boston and the Boston Legend, which featured an entire chapter dedicated to railroads. In an interview with the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Ernie Pyle, Beebe attributed his newfound enthusiasm for trains to this project, declaring, that's what turned him into a rail fan. During the interview, he also remarked that all rail fans are insane. From this budding interest in railroads, Beebe lamented that there were no suitable railroad photographs for his publications. This pushed Beebe to go out and make photographs he desired himself. This endeavor led to the creation of his 1938 book, High Iron, A Book of Trains. The book garnered immense popularity, with three editions published within the first month and nearly 10,000 copies sold. Beebe's early photographic style accentuated the dramatic motion of machines, setting a benchmark for what would later be recognized as the wedge of high perspective. His entire body of work came to encapsulate the grandeur and might of the railroad industry. Following the success of High Iron, Beebe released High Liners in 1940 and Trains in Transition in 1941. Both achieved notable sales figures. More significantly in 1941, however, Beebe met his future life partner, Charles Myron Clegg Jr. Clegg, hailing from a middle-class background, was born in Youngstown, Ohio. At the age of 21, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he secured a managerial position at a department store, allowing him to interact with the city's affluent circles. It was here that he was introduced to J. Edgar Hoover and joined his entourage. Through various social engagements, Beebe and Clegg eventually found themselves both attending a brunch in Washington, D.C., hosted by Evelyn Walsh McLean, the owner of the renowned Hope Diamond. Clegg described the meeting with Beebe in his own words. The party was about over. Most of the Supreme Court, Bill Rogers Jr., Lean Henderson, and the other guests had already left. Evie took Lucius and me by the arm, inviting us to join her at the bar to dish the dirt, as she put it. I found Lucius to be an enormous, almost majestic man with a thunderous voice. 
I also discovered that Lucius and I were both house guests and had to share a connecting bathroom in the West Wing. Very late that evening, I returned to the house after a strenuous night on the town with old friends and headed for my bathroom. There to my alarm was BB, fully clothed and asleep in some disarray with the bathtub and covered with spots of blood and the remains of a gigantic china pig, which apparently had caught his fancy as he passed unsteadily through the bedroom. I roused and undressed him, showered off the blood, swept up the pig, and put BB to bed with a stern lecture on how guests should behave in a nice private home. He had been a hotel child for too long. Then I went to my own bed, smoking a cigarette, fell asleep, and set fire to myself in the house as well. I think our mutual bad behavior enchanted each other, and we began a friendship that lasted more than a quarter of a century. Their relationship blossomed, and Clegg moved in with BB at the Madison Hotel in New York City. They would remain a couple for the rest of BB's life. During this time, and within certain upper-class circles of New York City society, openly gay men and women were accepted, even as couples. BB and Clegg likely experienced that same acceptance. The same was not true outside these circles, where discrimination against same-sex relationships was common. Shortly after Clegg's relocation and in the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack, he listed in the military. The following year, he was called up for service and sent to radio school in Oklahoma. Later, he would be stationed in San Francisco. In 1941, Clegg received a disarmable discharge. BB mentioned in his column that it was due to an eye injury, but there's stronger speculation that it related to Clegg's homosexuality. After his discharge, Clegg reunited with BB in New York. During this time, Beebe continued to produce an impressive body of literary work. In 1945, he released the book Highball, which marked Charles Clegg's first contribution. Clegg brought a more mature and experimental style of photography to their collaborative projects, notably departing from Beebe's favored wedge of pie perspectives. Their next publication together would be perhaps their most significant, Nick's Train Daily. Unlike their previous publications, which focused on the big and bold, Mixed Train Daily showcased the fading small and lesser-known railway lines in post-war America as the automobile industry took precedence and reshaped the landscape. It captured an America they were familiar with, an America of small towns and social interconnectedness, and through their photographs, they aimed to preserve as much of it as possible. True to Lucius Beebe's signature style, the book was launched with a charter train ride on the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad, where they invited publishers and the press to attend a grand gala that traversed the countryside. The festivities were so spectacular that they garnered the coverage of Life magazine, offering invaluable publicity. The book became a resounding success nationwide. Moreover, the work contained in Mixed Train Daily remains some of B.B. and Clegg's greatest photographic achievements. During that same period, the Cafe Society of New York City was waning, prompting B.B. and Clegg to seek out new places to settle. They were captivated by Nevada, particularly Virginia City. B.B. had fallen in love with the town's splendid collection of 20 Victorian saloons during a visit in 1937. When B.B. discovered that the town's population was just over 400, he exclaimed to Clegg, Kiddo, do you realize that there is one saloon for every 20 men, women, and children in this town? Do you recognize the absolute and ultimate progress when you encounter it? Well, I do. Why, the alcoholic proof here is so high and the moral tone so low that we can be absolutely inconspicuous. Let's see if there's a house for sale. Two years after arriving in Virginia City, they bought the Virginia City News and transformed it into the Territorial Enterprise, reclaiming its original title from the time when Mark Twain wrote for it. Through a coin flip, Clegg assumed the role of editor while Beebe became the publisher. Beebe and Clegg continued their prolific output, jointly producing up to three books per year throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s. Beebe's penchant for grand promotions and lively events remained unabated. Their success eventually led to unintended consequences, however. Their efforts played a significant role in revitalizing Virginia City and the Comstock region, making it a popular tourist destination. In 1959, the 100th anniversary of the Comstock Gold and Silver Strike brought attention. 
the television show Bonanza started featuring local sites for filming. Overwhelmed by the town's sudden popularity, Lucius and Chuck made the decision to sell the newspaper and relocate further west to Hillsboro, California. They spent a considerable amount of time traveling around the country in their private rail cars. In 1947, they acquired the Gold Coast from the Georgia Northern, and in 1953, they purchased the Virginia City, a car that became their prized possession. Both cars were extravagantly adorned in a lavish Victorian style and were used for promotional purposes related to their literary works. They also used the cars to transport their beloved St. Bernard, Mr. T-Bone Towser. Beebe continued writing weekly columns for the San Francisco Chronicle and several other magazines during this period as well. In February 1966, Lucius Beebe died of a heart attack. He had led a rich and extravagant life filled with indulgences. In the end, those indulgences caught up with him, resulting in bouts of gout and digestive ailments. Clegg went on to finish the two books they had been working on before his death, and for more than a year, magazines continued to print articles that Beebe had already written and submitted. Clegg himself died in 1979 from an apparent suicide. He was 63, plus one month, plus one week. This was the exact same age Lucius Beebe was when he died in 1966. It was Clegg's last tribute to Beebe. The two left an incredible legacy of railroad photography publishing contributions to the historical record, and they did it in style. They enhanced awareness of railroading and Western history in the American consciousness with their life-size personalities and demonstrated that railroads serve America as an icon of its experience. The closing line of Beebe's obituary in the San Francisco Chronicle read, I take leave of you with an apophorism of the late Michael Aaron, in his own way too a Renaissance man, although he only did one thing well, and that only once. I require very little of life. I only want the best of everything, and there's so little of that. Thank you for joining us for part one of this two-part Small Wonders series focusing on Lucius Beebe and Charles Clegg. We hope you have enjoyed learning about their lives, accomplishments, and their love story as much as we did. We also want to express special thanks and gratitude to the Center for Railroad Photography and Art and their dedicated staff and contributors for an incredible traveling exhibit, for creating this informative and well-produced video, and for all of their efforts to create and maintain a fantastic partnership with the museum. I hope you'll join me for the next episode of Small Wonders for part two of the series on BB and Clegg, as we explore the Colorado Railroad Museum's two Lens of Extravagance exhibits themselves. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.